take a journey on the Silk Road, Marco Polo's ancient route to China, produced at a cost of $50 million and requiring over 10 years to produce, the Silk Road video collection is comprised of separate adventures linking ancient and modern day Asia. Broadcast to outstanding critical acclaim in over 25 countries, the Silk Road is now available on video for the first time. With the entrancing music of Guitaro as a backdrop, each of the episodes in the collection focuses on the history, art, and culture of one of the world's most inaccessible regions. The old Silk Road ran westwards from the ancient capital of Chang'an, through the yellow tinge countryside, crossed the Yellow River, that mighty river of China, and continued across the great Gobi Desert to the west. At the beginning of September, a combined television team from China and Japan left Xi'an, which was once the old capital, Chang'an, to cross the Yellow River. The Yellow River is the mammoth stream which gave birth to the civilization of ancient China and nourished it. Into the river filters the yellow silt of the plain it flows through. Everyone who travels the Silk Road must somewhere or other cross the Yellow River. On the banks of the river, our team saw huge water wheels used to irrigate the land with a fertile and yellow river water. They were almost 18 meters or 60 feet in diameter, each with 68 ladles.
No one really knows who invented this kind of water wheel, but there's a legend that many centuries ago, Prince Zuo Zong Dao encouraged their use. They're still called Prince Zuo's wheels. The Yellow River often floods, but it also provides water for irrigation. The farmers consider it an enemy as well as a friend. Here, alongside the Yellow River, is a city, Lanjiu. Once it was just a small country town with a population of only about 70,000. Since the birth of the new China, though, it's become an important industrial city. Today, travelers cross the Yellow River at Lanzhou. But in the days of the Silk Road, they used to cross further upstream. This is a strange sort of boat for crossing the river. Yang Pi Fadzu. It's a kind of raft made from inflated goat skins. The heads and feet of the goats are cut off, the flesh and bones are extracted without impairing the skin, and then the hair is scraped off. Sometimes quite big rafts are constructed by using several skins. The really big rafts, made with many skins, are strong enough to carry oxen, horses and even camels. The ancient travellers along the Silk Road must have used rafts something like these. The ferrymen here manoeuvre their rafts skillfully, taking advantage of the currents. They can even cross where there are rapids by steering diagonally. But where did travellers long ago cross the Yellow River? Today, one of China's major hydroelectric dams has been constructed here. Liu Jia Xia Valley Dam took 15 years to build from 1958. Travelers on the Silk Road used to cross the Yellow River at a point far above this dam.
After the dam had been built, most of the Silk Road near the river disappeared under the waters of the new artificial lake. We took a three-hour boat ride to the old crossing place, Bing Ling Su. You can only visit this spot by boat for a short time in the autumn, when the water level is at its highest. It was the first time a television crew had ever been here. Bing Ling Su was a Buddhist temple built in the 4th and 5th century AD during the Northern Wei dynasty. It flourished for about a thousand years. A giant Buddha built during the Tang dynasty several hundred years later. It's almost 27 meters or 90 feet high. Around the giant Buddha on the cliff face, dozens of caves have been carved out, more than 180 of them altogether. Years of erosion have worn away the features of the rock-carved Buddha, but he still seems to smile benignly. He sits cross-legged, like most people of Asia still do. Buddhism, originating in India, went through various transformations during its journey along the Silk Road, according to the lifestyles of the different peoples. When the autumn's over and the waters begin to recede, this place becomes a group of isolated hilly islands. For a thousand kilometers or 600 miles westward from the Yellow River, the Silk Road passed along a narrow defile between the Chi Lien Mountains and the Gobi Desert. This defile is called the He Shi Corridor, and during its long history, it's been controlled by many different peoples. Perhaps the most powerful of all these peoples were the Huns, the nomads on horses whom the Chinese called Xiongnu. 
They controlled this corridor at the start of the Han Dynasty in the second century BC. Today, all you can see in the great Gobi Desert are rocks and bare earth. But in those days, it was the scene of many fierce battles between the Chinese and the Huns. Battles for control of the Silk Road and of the precious goods that passed along it. China's famous Great Wall was originally built as a defense against the Huns. And as the power of the Huns grew, so the wall was extended westwards. Even on a military campaign, the Huns for food depended on the great herds of goats which they always took with them. This was why the Great Wall only had to be high enough to prevent goats and horses from jumping over. The Chinese finally managed to get control of the whole of the He Shi Corridor during the reign of the Han Emperor Wu Di. In the year 121 BC, Emperor Wu Di sent an army a hundred thousand strong against the Huns. In one battle, the Chinese took 150,000 Hun prisoners. Now, the Silk Road was securely in the hands of the Chinese. They defended it like a military installation, and along the corridor they established four strongholds. One of the reasons the Emperor Wu Di had so much trouble with the Huns was because they had much better horses, the so-called heavenly western horses. And one of the reasons Wu Di wanted to extend his power westwards was to get his hands on a supply of these horses. Two hundred and eighty kilometers or one hundred and eighty miles west of Lanzhou is the town of Wu Wei, the first and biggest of the four Chinese strongholds in the He Shi corridor. All that's left today is the Citadel Gate. Recent excavations have brought to light an object which gives us an idea of how obsessed Emperor Wu Di was about obtaining those horses. It was unearthed in 1960, when relations between China and the Soviet Union began to deteriorate. The Chinese began to build underground air raid shelters, and during excavations they came across the tomb of a Han Dynasty general. Inside the tomb, this wonderful bronze statuette of a horse was found. In 
His feet seem to fly through the air, and his nostrils are drawn back as though he were neighing. One of his hooves is treading on a swallow. The message is easy to read. Here was a horse that could gallop faster than the flight of the swallow. This was the kind of horse that rulers of those days dreamed about. So marvellous seemed the Hun's cavalry that the Chinese called the horses heavenly western horses. And it was these the Han Emperor Wu Di admired so much. Over the ages, Chinese emperors have sent messengers westwards in search of the heavenly western horses. And they sent rolls of silk to pay for the horses, because in those days, silk was a form of currency in China. Today, the Chinese army still gets horses from the Shandan pastures in the Qilian mountains. Horses descended from the ancient heavenly horses are still bred here, and the pastures have a continuous history of 1,300 years. When these pastures were established during the Sui dynasty in the 6th century AD, a herd of 100,000 horses grazed on them. The modern horses have been interbred with smaller but tough Mongolian ponies, and with the big Kazakh horses, and today there's a herd of 200,000 in Shandan. The Chilean mountains, with plentiful water and rich grasslands, were looked on as an earthly paradise by the nomadic Huns. They came from the Yanji mountains, which were also called the Rouge mountains. They were called this because of a plant which grew there, which the Hun women used as a type of cosmetic. Today, the people still sing a plaintive song about how the Huns were defeated so many years ago. The song tells about how they were driven out of their mountains and how their brides no longer had rouge to paint their cheeks. We lost the Chilean mountains, our sheep, our horses, our cows. We lost the Yanjiu Mountains. Now there's no more rouge to colour our bride's cheeks. that flow through the Gobi Desert run in many channels which look like tangled threads and they often change course. Those that flow through the Gobi Desert run in many channels which look like tangled threads and they often change course.
The Dianye River has its source in the permanent snow fields of the Qilian Mountains. At times it's been called Ruo Shui, or the weak stream, or He Shui, or the black stream. And as it's changed its course, the desert has changed too. Sometimes when the snows on the Qilian Mountains melt, the river floods and completely alters the shape of the Hershi Corridor. Many oases and fortifications have disappeared because of changes in the course of the river. This is called the Le De Castle, and today it's on the banks of the Dianye River. It was built during the Han Dynasty about 2,000 years ago. But no one knows who built it, or when it was destroyed. Some people say it was destroyed in a mighty flood, and some say it was conquered by the great Mongolian ruler, Genghis Khan. In ancient China, a castle wasn't just a military structure. It provided shelter for an entire town, like a European walled city. Soldiers, merchants and craftsmen all lived together within its walls. Perhaps among the merchants who lived here, there were some with blue eyes, traders from the West. Today, the courtyards are covered with pieces of broken tile and countless shards of pottery. Many of the pieces can be identified, and the oldest ones date from the Han Dynasty 2,000 years ago. Even the most recent date back as far as 1,000 years ago. It seems strange to see the broken remains of things people made so long ago scattered at your feet. They say you can never guess what you'll find if you dig deep enough. But so far, no serious archaeological work has been done here. Once we were in the desert, it seemed as if we'd never see another town. In the old days, the camel caravans travelled from oasis to oasis in about half a day. A caravan could travel about 40 kilometres or 25 miles a day. So the oases must have been about 20 kilometres or 12 miles apart.
Halfway along the Hershey corridor, we saw camels for the first time. From this point westwards, the camel is an essential part of the lives of the people. Farmers load their crops onto the backs of the camels and builders use them to carry earth and sand. Sometimes people have to cross the entire Gobi Desert to buy the things they need. Here's one of the oases. It's mid-afternoon, so most of the grown-ups are sleeping, and the only voices you can hear are those of children. At an oasis, the main problems are floods in spring, dry spells during winter, and the persistent sand which chokes the crops. One young man working in a cabbage field said that everything they have today is the result of a never-ending battle with nature. The town of Jiangye is surrounded by rich, fertile land. It's the biggest oasis town in the whole of the Hershey Corridor. One of those four Han Dynasty strongholds was here, the second largest of the four. This town was a great centre of trade and barter for goods from the west and the east. During the various Chinese dynasties, officials were sent here from the capital to take control of the markets, and many merchants from the west used to gather here. In the 7th century AD, during the Sui dynasty, we know from records that merchants from no less than 27 countries were invited to Jiangye for what we'd call today an international trade conference. On every street corner you can see farmers selling newly picked fruit and fresh vegetables. In this town, everybody is allowed to sell his produce just as he pleases. As in many eastern countries, the people rest during the hot afternoon and by midday the streets are full of people on their way home. I'm <laughs> sorry. 
Here are green peppers and tomatoes, which were introduced by merchants from the West. A couple of old men are playing a kind of Chinese chess. In Jiangye, the streets are always full of the friendly chatter of innumerable people. It's a pleasant place to come to when you've been traveling across the desert. During the second half of the 13th century, during the brief Yuan dynasty, which was of Mongol origin, a famous Italian came to this oasis town and lived here for a year, Marco Polo. Marco Polo had arrived from the Pamirs via the Hershey Corridor and he wrote about Jiang Ye in his diary. This is what he wrote. Jiang Ye is a fine large town with a few Muslims and Christians as well as Buddhists. There are many Buddhist temples and Buddhist images can be seen all over the town. Among these are several of great size, some of which are covered with gold leaf and are of quite superior workmanship. One particularly big statue is lying on its side. It's surrounded by several smaller figures praying. Marco Polo was talking about the Nye Pan Buddha, which still exists today. It's more than 35 meters or 100 feet long and was made in the year 1098. So it was already more than 200 years old when Marco Polo saw it. Although it's true that the Chinese first really opened up the Hershey Corridor, they only actually controlled strongholds and important sections of the route. Many tribes have fought battles here since the Han Dynasty in spite of the Chinese being in control. The merchants from the west came through here with their camels on their way to Chang'an and most of them were members of small tribes from Central Asia. Many of those tribes are only known today because their merchants once used to frequent the Hershey Corridor.
we went up into the Chilean mountains to look for evidence of some of the old tribes. Here we're about 200 kilometers or 120 miles off the Silk Road and in these foothills a number of nomadic people are still living. They include Ugu and Hui tribesmen, Tibetans and Manchus. We often saw people on the move with their tents carried on the backs of their yaks followed by herds of goats. After the revolution, the Chinese government protected these small tribes by setting up autonomous governments in various places. We visited the Sunan Ugu Autonomous Region, which is almost 3,000 meters or 10,000 feet above sea level. The Ugu people greeted us in a special folk costume which they wear only on festive occasions. In their own language, the Ugu people call themselves Uyghurs. The two characters that they use when writing this in Chinese mean rich and strong. And these characters were recently adopted as a sort of good luck charm. The clothing of the Ugu people is rather like that in Tibet, but their features are more like Mongolians. They speak the Uyghur language and their religion is Lamaistic Buddhism, like the Tibetans. But there are no records to suggest which of the ancient Silk Road tribes they're descended from. The tribe has no writing system of its own, but today the young people are studying Chinese, including Chinese characters, and many of them have adopted Chinese names. Their staple foods are wheat and the meat of goats. This is a kind of soup made from yak's milk and tea leaves, their only source of vitamin C.
When the winter snows start in October, the people would abandon their nomadic life for the year and come down from the mountains. The Great Wall of China is almost 5,000 kilometers long or 3,000 miles and at its western end is a huge fortress. This castle, Jia Yu Chuan, was built in the 14th century during the Ming Dynasty. A unit of about 300 soldiers was stationed here to guard the country from invasion from the west. A path only wide enough for a single horse climbs the castle walls. If a soldier who had been on patrol arrived to warn of an impending attack, he could enter the castle directly by this path. It was a lonely life for the soldiers, far from their homes and families. When they left for the battle, they'd throw a stone under the gate of the castle. If the sound of the stone echoed back with a holly ring, the soldiers believed that they too would return safely to the fort. Fierce dragons on the castle walls face the direction of danger, the west. For the Hershey Corridor was the scene of battles which marked the rise and fall of many peoples. But it was here that a vital communication link was forged. The Silk Road, connecting east and west. Take a journey on the Silk Road, Marco Polo's ancient route to China, produced at a cost of $50 million and requiring over 10 years to produce. The Silk Road video collection is comprised of separate adventures linking ancient and modern day Asia. Broadcast to outstanding critical acclaim in over 25 countries, the Silk Road is now available on video for the first time. With the entrancing music of Guitaro as a backdrop, each of the episodes in the collection focuses on the history, art, and culture of one of the world's most inaccessible regions. 
In the glories of ancient Chang'an, you'll visit the starting point of the Silk Road, Chang'an, the world's largest city in the 7th century. You'll see the incredible clay army, buried for almost 2,000 years. The discovery of these 6,000 statues was an archaeological triumph, and the Silk Road crew were the first foreigners allowed to photograph it. Thrill at the sculptures deep in the world's largest tomb, and then enter China's most hallowed Buddhist temple. Examine the hidden underground murals of a legendary princess, and walk the only man-made object visible from outer space, the Great Wall of China. In a thousand kilometers beyond the Yellow River, you'll cross the Yellow River in a goatskin raft, gaze in awe at the same giant Buddha that Marco Polo saw 700 years ago. Look with amazement at the huge water wheels that irrigate miles of Chinese croplands, and visit the secret caves of Bingli Sea, never before photographed by a television crew. Then, transverse the forbidden corridor between the mountains and the Gobi Desert, where the Huns battled the Chinese for control over the most prized horses in the world. In the art gallery in the desert, you'll tour the legendary Magao Caves at Dunhuang, over 500 caves filled with more than 3,000 murals and statues, dating back to the 4th century AD, an oasis of history located in the middle of the Gobi Desert. These incredible man-made caves are an architectural masterpiece and the dream of art scholars around the world. Now, you will be among the first Westerners to visit them, and you'll see for yourself why these artifacts are considered to be among the most priceless treasures on Earth. In the Dark Castle, you'll encounter a mysterious ghost castle situated in the Gobi Desert. These ruins are all that remain after Genghis Khan obliterated the legendary city of Karakoto and exterminated the people that built it. After the Russian explorer Kozlov unearthed the castle, he took its incomparable treasures to the Russian art museum, the Hermitage. The castle, believed by the Chinese to be cursed, has not been entered for over 50 years until now. The castle stands near the Russian-Chinese border and is in a sensitive military zone normally closed to anyone but the Chinese army. You can only visit this region today via the Silk Road. The journey continues in search of the lost kingdom of Lulan, where you'll discover a lost kingdom which vanished into the sands of the desert. Join the first journey in half a century to seek these ruins. You'll uncover Silk Road relics that have been buried for over a millennium, and you'll unearth a mummy that's been preserved in a secret grave for over 2,000 years. The wind-carved rocks of the desert surround you at every turn. You'll gaze in amazement at the beauty that has taken nature and eternity to create. In across the Taklamakan Desert, you'll be the first foreign visitors in over 75 years to visit the ancient Buddhist city of Muran. Visit the beautiful home of a Chinese farmer and his family, and the gardens and vineyards that surround their land. Meet nomads in an oasis town, and be delighted as the village children sing and dance for you. You'll then attempt to cross the desert described by the locals as the place from which nothing living returns. After losing your way in the 120 degree heat, your caravan will stumble into ancient ruins and then attempt a night escape across the desert to safety. The Silk Road is an opportunity to travel through Asia as never before possible. Experience a voyage into the past by visiting the present. Examine the art, thrill to the scenery, and enjoy the hospitality of the people of these far off regions. Your copy of The Silk Road will be your passport to an unforgettable journey.